to the first uh, pediatric grand rounds of the uh, new academic year. Uh, Dr. Jabour is away on vacation this week, and so it's my pleasure to be um, uh, the host for this morning's grand rounds and to introduce our um, guest speaker. So this morning's uh, speaker is, is Dr. Nancy Young, who has recently joined CHEO as a senior scientist in our data-driven discovery uh, team, and she's an adjunct professor at the School of Epidemiology and Public Health in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. Uh, Nancy is a measurement scientist whose research program focuses on children's health. She completed her undergraduate training in physical therapy, her master's in clinical epidemiology in 1994, and her PhD in measurement science in 1997 at the University of Toronto. She began her career as a scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children, moved to Laurentian University in 2005 as a Canada Research Chair in Rural and Northern Children's Health, and went on to become the Director of the School of Rural and Northern Health. She joined CHEO Research Institute on July 1st as a senior scientist. Nancy has spent 25 years applying measurement science to give children a voice in their own health assessment. Her primary focus is the development of child-centric health assessment measures. Since 2009, she has worked in respectful collaboration with Indigenous health leaders and academic scholars to create new processes to measure and respond to the health of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children. Her research program is highly collaborative and is funded by the Ministry of Children, Community, and Social Services in Ontario, the Cundell Foundation, CIHR, Health Can uh, and Health Canada. Today, she's going to share with us some of her research and challenge you to consider how it may impact your clinical practice. Before uh, Nancy begins, I want to uh, do our land acknowledgement, which is particularly poignant given the topic of this morning's Grand Rounds. Ottawa is built on the unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. The peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabe nation have lived on this territory for millennia, and we honor them in this land. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. Chio also honors all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and their valuable past, present, and future contributions to this land. Nancy. Thank you so much, Jason, for that uh, wonderful introduction. So my talk today is titled, How Are You? And it will become apparent um, a little bit later why it is, How Are You? But I'm gonna talk about a measurement science approach to engaging Indigenous children in health assessment. And I had set out four learning objectives, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, um, but to um, just put them here so you can have a quick glance if you haven't seen them already. And I want to thank Jason for doing the land acknowledgement. I am presenting from the territory of the Tikamekshing Anishinaabek on the lands governed by the Robinson Hearing Treaty of 1850. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities across Turtle Island who've contributed to the journey that I will share with you today. So Jason already did a great job of presenting who I am. I'm a measurement science, scientist with clinical roots and I'm on my journey to become an ally. I don't believe it's a destination. I very much think it's something that we continue to build over time. And I'm also a mentor. And several members of my team are with me today, which is um, wonderful. So thanks all for joining. So Jason went through my scientific expertise, but I started out looking at child-centric approaches. And then I applied those approaches to different populations. And some of those populations include some of the scientists at CHEO, such as the work on the kids ITP tool that I was engaged in with Dr. Robert Clausen as the lead. And I've eventually become a recognized expert in cross-cultural adaptation of outcome measures and have had the opportunity now to apply those concepts um, with and for Indigenous children. So CHEO is dedicated to making discoveries to inspire the best life for children and youth. And I hope to encourage discoveries that inspire the best life for Indigenous children and youth. So I'm hoping that I can interject the Indigenous as each of you interject your own populations in the work that you do at the CHEO Research Institute. The work I've done with Indigenous children has been the result of meaningful collaboration. And there are many, many people that I could acknowledge. Um, I'd like to acknowledge 
um, Mary Jo Wabineau, who has been my partner and started me on this journey, um, and Dr. Rita Corbier, who has been my guide. Um, she is an elder in the Wikwemcom community um, and has been a, a key part of this journey. So I, one of the objectives was to help you think about the unique needs and project and perspectives of Indigenous children. And I will do a little bit of very brief background on this. So at the moment, they're saying that about 4.9% of the Canadian population are Indigenous. That's based on the 2016 census, and that's a rapidly growing number, so I suspect it is much higher by now. The mean age of Indigenous people in Canada is 29 years, which is very different than the 40.7 year average age of other Canadians. The mean age drops to 25.6 when they're on reserve. And the reason I present these age statistics is that there's a whopping one third of um, Indigenous communities that are children. And so they are a key um, focus for me. The rights of Indigenous children are well documented, and I've put up some of the documentation here that supports them, beginning with the Declaration of Human Rights and going on to the UN Declaration of the Rights of the Child in 1959. But there is a Convention on the Rights of the Child from UNICEF. There is the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. So if anybody's heard UNDRIP and wondered what UNDRIP is, this is what UNDRIP is. To the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Canada adopted that in 2008. And there's also more recently been a Children's Bill of Rights written by the chief in Wigwamakong. So there's lots of documentation that underpins the rights of Indigenous children. Despite these rights, Indigenous children's health requires special attention. They have some of the worst health outcomes, high rates of chronic illness, early death, poor global health ratings compared to the Canadian population and a lack of statistics to support it. So the document that I have up here from UNICEF is from 2009. There hasn't been another really comprehensive compendium of this type since then. They also have less access to care in part because of geography, living in rural and remote communities means that you do have limited service. But this population often lack the means to travel to urban centers for care, and they often don't feel safe accessing care in mainstream centers. And so that's something I'd like to draw everybody's attention to, is to do what you can to make them feel safe within GEO. Indigenous children are incredibly resilient. They are survivors. I have been so impressed uh, by the strengths that they bring and the diversity that I've seen within these populations. They are the fastest growing segment of the Canadian population and we need to be prepared to support them. So how did they get into this state of poor health? And I'm gonna go backwards in order to go forwards because the history is important. There's a causal relationship between the history of colonization and the health inequities that we see in Indigenous children today. Once we recognize that that's the source of the problem, we can move towards solutions. And it's not going to be a quick fix um, and it's not going to be easy, but together it is something that we can make progress on. So the history of colonization, some would say, starts with the Indian Act of 1876, which is still in force. And we're all very aware of the mandated attendance in residential schools and the impacts that's causing. But treaties also have an impact and they cause a loss of traditional territories, breaking people up, losing language. The residential schools, the 60s scoop and the millennial scoop all have had an impact. But this is not history as in past tense. I want people to understand that the trauma and the colonization is an ongoing impact, which is why changing their health is so difficult. But I wanna focus on strengths because we can all contribute to reconciliation by promoting health equity for indigenous children and youth. And I think most of you are probably familiar with a diagram like this that shows equity and the extra supports that have to be put under people who are sometimes deemed more fragile. I'd like to suggest that indigenous children are not more fragile but rather that they didn't get in the state on their own. Part of what has happened 
is colonization has dug a hole under these children. So we need to boost them up because we've started them in a hole. How do we fill the hole? One of the solutions that's been really effective in mainstream science is evidence-based medicine. It's credited with great improvements in health outcomes, such as the decrease in uh, mortality associated with pediatric oncology. Phenomenal improvements. Indigenous children have been missing from evidence-based medicine. Those living on reserve are almost invisible in the literature. They're often not recruited in studies. They often aren't comfortable consenting when they are. So for a variety of reasons, they are invisible in that literature. And I would also argue that the evidence-based literature or evidence-based medicine may not deliver the wisdom that indigenous communities are seeking. It may not be consistent with their worldview. I have met many indigenous leaders who are truly interested in accessing good data. They don't want Western data, they want data that is meaningful for them. The data related to the health of indigenous children is meaningful to them, but it's extremely limited. Their worldview sees an interrelationship between spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental health. And the spiritual piece has consistently been missing. So that's one of the pieces that they have been looking for. Now, if you think about how their services are planned, particularly for populations living on reserve, and I realize there is a very large urban population of indigenous people as well, they're often locally planned and delivered. Even in urban centers, you have Aboriginal health access centers delivering services for small groups. Yet most of the data that we see is aggregated at the national and provincial level. So any statistics that you find are often national or provincial. And they have to extrapolate from that to decide what is in the best interest of their local health center. So indigenous leaders have almost no relevant data to inform planning or service delivery. And that's where I'm suggesting that we consider the value of small data. And this was not my idea. This idea came to me from Mary Jo Wamano in Wikwemakong, who said, why can't we just have a little bit of data about the children in our community? So in the absence of big data, what can we learn from small data? And I have used the elephant and the mouse intentionally because sometimes I get the sense that big data people are threatened or scared by small data and there's no reason to be scared by the small data. But we do need to recognize and respect both data sovereignty and the privacy protections of the people who are represented in that data. So I was invited many years ago back in 2009 to collaborate on the development of an Indigenous child health measure. What Wikwemkom wanted was something that was congruous with their worldview, was psychometrically sound so that if they used the data in proposals to the government, that it would be found to be scientifically rigorous and that it could inform local practice. And that's where the small data request came from information just about the community to guide the services that are being delivered in the community. And community can be geographic community, it can be an agency or organization, we define it fairly broadly. And it's been a privilege to do this work um, with several Indigenous communities. And my way of honouring partners is to respect the wisdom from the community and ensure that their protocols are followed. And I will come back to protocols several times during the presentation. So I've also talked about the data must be meaningful. Meaningful boiled down to, it needs to be able to identify the needs of children. So at the individual child level, it needs to generate useful information to help that child. It also needs to inform health planning at the community level. And that was the initial request. But the first bullet, which is identify the needs of children, came up along the way. And it needs to respect Indigenous protocols and data sovereignty is an important one that will come up in about five to 10 minutes. So I'm going to tell you the story of how we created what was the Aboriginal Children's Health and Wellbeing Measure. And now the A has changed. It is no longer Aboriginal. Stay tuned. So it's a shared journey uh, between Mary Jo, 
who is in Wickram Kong, which is on Manitoulin Island in Georgian Bay, and myself um, in Sudbury. And this journey started back in 2009. Our journey blended Indigenous ways of knowing and Western science. So we were looking at where those two come together and the ethical space in between. It forms a safe space where collaboration thrives. But once again, there need to be protocols and protections in place, both for privacy, but also for data sovereignty. The development of the measure followed a mixed methods approach. The measure development part of it was qualitative with indigenous teachings, photo voice activities, focus groups, qualitative analysis and debriefing. And the photo that's shown on this slide is one that our participants took in a, in a focus group back in uh, 2010. Um, the psychometric testing was quantitative. We tested reliability, validity, sensitivity, and specificity. So we've merged things that usually don't go together into one project. What came out of this is a tablet-based health and well-being assessment. It was developed for and with First Nation, Inuit, and Métis children. Every single question that is in it was written by a child. The concepts within it, the domains, if you will, were based on the Anishinaabe medicine wheel. So spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental, uh, which is intellectual or cognitive, depending on um, your preference. All of the results that we gathered from our studies were shared first with the community, approved by chief and council, and then submitted for publication. So it's a much longer process than we're used to. We published the process for creating the measure. We published interpretations from the children to ensure that it was measuring what we thought it was measuring. And we published a paper on the relevance beyond the one community where we went and tested it with several other communities, including the Inugatagit organization in Ottawa, which was then Ottawa Inuit Children's Center. All of the papers are also available on our website, which I will give you at the end of the presentation. So if you're interested in any of them, there's an easy place to find them. Along our journey, if I go back to the tablet, so we've got a tablet that actually measures the health of Indigenous children. And I told you that all of the questions were written by children. Well, the children wrote some provocative questions about personal safety and other things. Because of those, we had a moral responsibility. If the data was intended to be used at a community level, that's great, but it's gathered from individual children. And we, who were researchers and community leaders, needed to find a way to listen and respond to the children along the way. It's become a way in which we show respect to each child. If you think about sitting a child down with a tablet, they have the privacy, they go through, they answer the questions, and you say, thank you, goodbye. They might not be done. There might be something in there that they wanna talk about. So it is our ethical and moral responsibility to follow up, particularly on the safety questions. This is how we demonstrate that children are not just data points. They're an important part of the process and the opportunity to connect them with services through what was research, was an amazing opportunity. And we always said, if we could sit the children down and get them to talk, albeit to a tablet, it was a good first step and we needed to take the follow up steps. So because of that, a screening process was added. And this was the wisdom of the Nadmadwin Mental Health Clinic staff in Wickwamacom. They identified 18 questions within the measure that they wanted us to flag so that they would know about the answers immediately as the child finished answering the questions. That then allows us to pass the tablets over to a local health worker who can follow up on any potential concerns. And I should have underlined potential because the tablet is not diagnostic. It was never intended to be diagnostic, but it gives you what the child is thinking. And if the child says, I don't feel safe at home very often, then somebody needs to follow up and have the conversation. That conversation could lead, could lead to some very funny humor about the mice under the bed, the spider in the corner, or it could lead to a more serious conversation. That's the role of the local health services is to have brief conversations with those children, determine if the tablet 
was picking up something that needs follow up or if it's a if it's a good laugh and the child goes on their way. So the screening mechanism was also published. About that time, the same time, we had a celebration in Wikwemakong um, to share with the children what we'd learned to let them see and feel and touch the work that they'd completed. And here are some of the children who participated in that celebration, along with Linda Caboni, who is a mental health worker, um, who is a key part of this day and many other days with the children. The children called it Anishinaabegi, and that is where the new A comes from. So ACHWM, the A in Aboriginal has been replaced with the A in Anishinaabegi, which is how are you in the Anishinaabe language. Many other communities have given the ACHWM a name in their traditional language. Clearly ACHWM is our name, it's not their name, but as they name it in the language, it becomes that much more comfortable to the children. And we do have a version for Inuit children. The Inuktitut name that they gave it is Kanwipe. <clears throat> Excuse me, Kanwipe. There's also Kamansavo for Michif and several other names. There are essentially 12 versions. It's a combination of First Nation Inuit and Métis versions, but all of those exist in English and French and they exist for a standard population as well as for children in family services who have multiple families and struggled with some of the single family questions. We have a screening and triage process. We have a comprehensive website with checklists, training videos, and other resources. We have automated online reports, and we have amazing people like Mia Burke and Lily Racine Bouchard who are part of the team who support communities. So what does this thing look like in a nutshell. So we give the tablet to a child. It takes them 10 to 15 minutes to complete it. If they struggle with reading, the tablets can talk, they plug in their earbuds, they have privacy, and they can go through it independently. They don't need anybody to help them through. When they're done, a password is entered by a health worker, and that displays the screening results. So if there are any concerning responses, they come up immediately. There's an opportunity to figure out that no, they weren't right, it was something else, the child hit the wrong button, or there's another conversation that needs to be had. From the tablet, we also get a balance chart, and this is the information that's intended for children. We show children their medicine wheel, either in medicine wheel colors or in colors that don't look like a First Nations um, medicine wheel. This encourages the mental health team to have a conversation with the children about strengths. If you look at the red pie piece at the bottom, that's the physical component of the measure. And it is very strong in this child. The mental health worker or the local health worker will talk about that success and ask them, where does your physical strength come from? What does that look like? And they'll go off on a story about their hockey or their soccer and it helps engage the children and it leads us to conversations that can then support the deficit that we're seeing in emotional health. The data is uploaded over Wi-Fi and all of our data is connected to a REDCap server. It's not yet on the CHEO REDCap server, but that is where it is going in the next few months. That data then leads to automated reporting that informs programming for children and youth in the community. So that is the cycle. That's how the flow goes with the ACHWM. There's a lot more information available on our website. There's a video that goes through it in about four and a half minutes. Um, and there are a lot of resources, some of which require a password to access. But if you're willing to submit your email and set up a password, you can get access to all of it. So I'm gonna to talk to you now about the measurement science side of things. So I've been through all of the qualitative work. But what did we do measurement science-wise? So we started testing the ACHWM for validity, reliability, sensitivity, and specificity. And that work mostly happened between 2014 and 2016. And it's really important to note that yes, the ACH, ACHWM does meet the psychometric criteria. So what came from the wisdom of children actually does remarkably well when you test it against Western standards. And as you might expect, 
All of these papers were also reviewed by chief and council, presented to communities, and then published. So we've learned about the distribution of the summary scores. This was an important piece that was done by several communities together to show what the distribution of their scores was, mainly so that other communities would know what a 60 meant. They got a 60, they're not doing great. If they got an 85, they're doing great. The mean for the summary score came out to be about 74.1. And that was a paper that I'm really proud was published in CMAJ. And the lead authors on that paper are all First Nations health directors. We also published the distribution of the quadrant scores. So here's the summary score in gray the spiritual score, emotional score, physical, and mental score. And this cognition or intellectual functioning score is always a little bit low, and we're still doing work to understand that. It was published in CMAJ Open. So some of our more recent discoveries are what I'd like to highlight now. So, I worked with Sky Barbic out of UBC over the past five years, and she's applied rash measurement theory to the ACHWM items. So there's 62 items within this. And if any of you remember back to when I showed you the circle of how we go through the process, I said it takes 10 to 15 minutes. So children can go through 62 items fairly quickly because most of them have the same response option and they are worded very simply. They very quickly go through and share their perspective. So when we took those 62 items and we applied rash measurement theory, we found a little bit of disordering in some of the response options. So we've collapsed the response options from five categories to three categories, and that generated an excellent fit overall. And what you can see here is the distribution of the children, in their scores and at the bottom, you can see the distribution of the items. Now the distribution of the items is not quite as pretty. There's a gap up the top end around four and there's a gap just before minus three at the bottom. But overall, we've got questions that tap various degrees of wellness in these children. So it goes entirely from illness to wellness, which was our goal. These graphs show the distribution for the quadrant scores, spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical. And the mental has more gaps in it because there's only nine items in mental. There's only nine items because the children only put nine items in there. We did not tweak what the children did. Most, the, the greatest number of items are emotional and physical. So in the summer of 2020, we had a knowledge synthesis grant. It was a COVID rapid response um, funding opportunity. And we put in a project that we called Valuing Indigenous Emotional Wellness, or VIEW. And over the course of six months, we created a resource hub to go with the ACHWM. So the ACHWM is a measurement tool. Now we have health resources that dovetail with that measurement tool. So the biggest part of the work was a scoping review, and we identified 52 mental health programs that were relevant to Indigenous children and youth. And the criteria for including them were that they were about mental health of children and youth. Things like the Journey to Wellness, for example, is a program out of Battle River, Saskatchewan that was included in this. Um, that they be culturally relevant, that they be feasible in lower resource context and that they have evidence of effectiveness. So we went through and did the groundwork so that mental health workers in Indigenous communities can go to the table, find some things they like, pick up some tip sheets, and provide something new for their children. This, we hope, will be helpful as they try and support the children as they recover from the COVID experience. There's also a whole um, number of activity pages, emotions charts, and other resources. And many of these were created by Indigenous artists. Um, we gave artists the opportunity to sign their names on their work um, if they chose to. So many of these have names on them. Um, so there's an emotions chart that First Nations and Inuit and Métis children can identify with because the reactions are more like their own. 
There are things like butterfly breathing, which takes your standard breathing exercise and puts it in a context of nature. And all of the work that's on there is governed by a Creative Commons license. We give people access to PDFs. We also give them access to Word versions if they want to edit and change it. One of the activities we've asked several of our community partners to do is to take this emotions chart and put the words in their language on that chart. And they can send it back to us if they want us to share it with other communities or they can keep it for their own use. We've also completed an Ontario Sport Impact Grant. And that study had two questions. The first was, is the Anishinaabegi or ACHWM able to identify children's health needs earlier in their illness compared to the standard referral process? The second question was, if we find them earlier, does it lead to better outcomes or faster recovery compared to what we call the typical treatment group? which was a group of children who were already accessing mental health services. So did we find them earlier? This table shows the emotional quadrant scores. The newly identified are community-based kids who we did a survey with and we found that they needed support. They did not previously recognize that they needed support. Their mean emotional score was 67.3 compared to the typical treatment group of 66.2. So no, we didn't find them earlier on their journey. But if you look at these groups compared to healthy peers, so people who completed the measure, but did not need additional support, their mean score for emotions is up at 80.2. So both of those groups are clearly different from the healthy group. So we can pick out that difference, which is really important. This shows you the newly identified needs group in the left of each pairing and the typical treatment group in the right. And it just reinforces that we did not find a different group of kids. We found the same group of children, except they did not yet recognize they needed support. So what happened when we gave them support? So these are the patterns of change over time. And the light green line is the healthy peers. We weren't doing anything to support them and they didn't change. The newly identified needs group, the children that we literally plucked out of the community and connected to additional supports, which could have been natural helpers, wasn't always clinical support, are shown here in the orange line and the typical treatment in pink. Now, both of the groups in treatment are getting better. Small improvement, but they are getting better. But this newly identified group seems to be doing exceptionally well with support. These are the changes in the emotional scores over one year. So no change in the healthy peers baseline to follow up. Big change in the newly identified group and somewhat um, smaller change in the typical treatment group, but there is change. But these numbers are really small. These are only the kids that we had one year follow up for. And these are the box plots that show the change in emotions over a year. So you can see that three quarters of the newly identified group had improvement. There's still a quarter that weren't improving and that is not unusual. Um, it's a slightly bigger group than the typical treatment group, but everybody in those treatment groups is improving and the healthy peers are staying stable. What else did we learn? I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this slide, except to say that our newly identified needs group had a median number of treatments of one. They often needed one visit. They got connected to natural helpers, they had a good conversation with a family member, and they got off on the right path. It did not take much to support them on their journey to wellness. The typical treatment group in contrast took six visits. So it's more intensive if you wait for them to show up at the door through typical processes. So we found that the ACHWM provides an option to help children and youth talk about their health. It's valid from eight to 18 years of age. It's a non-judgmental approach and it's very efficient. It provides an opportunity to identify urgent needs and connect children and youth with local supports that meets the needs of community. They're needing to find a way to connect with these children. 
And the process is building relationships to help focus on wellness. So we're not talking about illness, we're talking about wellness. So I did tell you that we would come back to this idea of protocols and data sovereignty. So why is data sovereignty important? So indigenous leaders are responsible for the well-being of their lands and their members. These responsibilities are governed by protocols. The protocols differ community to community. And as researchers, we need to learn those protocols. But part of the protocol is that indigenous people have a right to access and control the data that's gathered about their people. And it's our responsibility as scientists to make that possible. So I frequently refer to my team as being like a duck because it looks simple and easy on the surface. But underneath, we use technology, web-based uh, websites, uh, REDCap, progressive web apps to do all of the hard paddling so that it's easy for children, it's easy for communities. And we're constantly innovating. So we're constantly paddling in a slightly different direction to meet the needs of yet one more community. So there's two protocols that are well documented that may be helpful to you. And one is the First Nations OCAP principles. And sorry, I don't know where my trademark went. OCAP should have a trademark on it. It stands for ownership, control, access, and possession. There's also eight Inuit IQ principles that are also related to the protocols that we must follow in community. So I'm gonna focus on the first one because most of our work has focused on First Nations. And I'm gonna tell you how the ACHWM follows through on OCAP. So the ownership piece. So the ACHWM has a web portal and communities can go in and sign up and set up their own projects. They don't actually need to talk to us. Their data is kept separate in a separate red cap project. So there are, so the data from two communities is never merged, at least not at the source. Control means that community leaders are the decision makers. They have the ability to add or remove staff members from their project. They can actually remove their data from the REDCap server, which is a little innovation on REDCap that we had to custom program. Access means that there's online reporting that's controlled by passwords. So communities can go in at any time of the day and access an online report that gives them the basic information that they might want for an application for funding, that they might want to evaluate a program. It's there, it's available. We've done as much of the analysis as we can in simple descriptive stats that's ready 24 seven for them. In possession, they can download their raw data uh, and it is controlled by passwords. And the one important piece of the protocol is that the data is technically de-identified. There may be an identifier on it that means something in the community, but on the REDCap server, that data is completely de-identified from my perspective. And the ACHWM team are stewards of the data. We have the opportunity to request permission to use the data for secondary analysis, and we have pooled the data in past, but it's always after the fact with permissions from community. And that ability to use it for secondary data analysis is also in the consent forms that communities use when they gather the data. So I'm gonna change direction uh, and talk briefly about where we're going now, the things that we're doing to innovate on the ACHWM. So one of them is an ACHWM for younger children. We call it the little kids version. It's geared to four to eight year olds. So children who are just under eight years of age. And it's come out of the rash analysis. We've picked up 25 of the wellness items that reflect the quadrant score distributions. And we've put them together in a measure that can be done by a child and a caregiver in a dyad. So two people together complete it. Any of the flagged questions, and there's only five in the little kids version, can be handled by a caregiver. There are things that are just a healthy conversation that needs to be had. So we don't necessarily need a mental health worker on standby to administer the little kids ACHWM. We're 
also actively engaging with Métis organizations to explore any further adaptation, to do any psychometric testing if needed, uh, and to update our reports if required. And both of those pieces, the Little Kids version and the Métis, are supported by our current Health Canada grant, which extends until 2026. We're also doing some work adapting the Can We Pay Free category. So we have a version for Inuit children, but it was developed in Ottawa. So we have a process where we're going to do some additional work to make sure it works in Inungan. We're also identifying culturally relevant consent processes. So we've realized through our journey that signed consent is problematic in this population. And we're trying to find something that is culturally acceptable, would be acceptable to ethics boards, protects the rights of the children, as well as the rights of the parents. And that work is funded by our CIHR Pathways to Health Equity Grant. So I'm nearing the end of my presentation and I want you to consider the impact on your clinical and research practices, the impact of the things I've shared with you today. So what do the lessons that I've shared mean to you in your clinical practice? And I wanna start by asking you to reflect. How many of your patients are First Nation, Inuit, or Métis? I want you to also think how many of them may be Indigenous, but they didn't feel safe to share that identity with you. And I want you to consider how does sharing their identity help them? Because if it isn't helpful for them to share their identity, they're not going to share it. So I know that some of you are already making great strides in changing this pattern of hidden identity. And I really wanna thank you for that, particularly a shout out to the Inuit clinic that's happening at CHEO. All really exciting stuff. So you can all consider new methods to engage with indigenous children and youth once they identify. I'd also like to offer you the opportunity to consider the ACHWM. Maybe it can help you measure um, the health of the children in your clinic and start strength-based conversations rather than deficit-focused conversations. Maybe you can find some of the resources that are helpful to the kids when they're sitting in the waiting room. Um, I also like you to consider whose guidance you should elicit in making these changes. And think if you're collecting data, who will own it? It's not an easy question. In your research practice, Think about opportunities to address the 94 calls to action and support health equity for Indigenous children. Again, you can consider new methods to engage Indigenous children in your research. Consider what collaboration really means. Bring in the strengths you need through relationships. I am not an Indigenous person. I don't have a deep understanding of Indigenous communities. I'm on my learning journey. But Mary Jo, Linda, Co Linda Caboni, um, Diane Jacko and many others have brought that to the table. My job has been to give back in unexpected ways. Giving them an online report was not something they ever imagined, but something that they use. But only do the work if it will mean something and if you can sustain it. So I have a few reminders here um, about the importance of building relationships to identify initiatives that are important to the Indigenous partners. They will invest if this meets their needs. Respect their worldviews. Now, early on, I showed you the pyramid that belongs to evidence-based medicine. I'm going to suggest you'll do better with circles, not pyramids, with an Indigenous population. Follow the local protocols. Take a strengths-based approach. That's one of the take-homes for me from working with Indigenous communities is how amazing a strength-based approach is strive for balance. And there are many Indigenous teachings on balance that I have had the privilege of, of learning from. And let the best interests of the children guide your decisions. So I have a few quick wrap-up questions for you, and then I will respond to your questions for me. The first one, did I stretch your brain in a good way? Did you find a lesson that is relevant to your work? And are you interested in collaborating? So I am very eager to 
collaborate broadly with people at the TO Hospital as well as the Research Institute. We are really looking for people who can help us with Métis collaborations in particular, um, but open to conversations and discussions. And I'd like to give a special thanks to the organizations where this research began, starting with Wigwemakong and then Laurentian University. Um, and I'm sincerely grateful to CHEO for solidifying the future of this research program. So I'm gonna end by saying thank you in many, many languages. And I need to thank Mia Burke who created some of this. And I'm gonna leave you with a few resources um, and open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Nancy. What a wonderful example of, of true partnership and collaboration with, uh, with community members. Um, Nancy uh, mentioned mentorship early in her talk, and I think uh, you will all agree that uh, Nancy will be a tremendous resource for all of us uh, and mentor us in how to better engage and integrate um, Indigenous uh, communities in our research and in our clinical practice. So questions for uh, Nancy, please uh, raise your uh, electronic hand or uh, put a question in the chat. Dr. Jetty. I just wanted to say thank you, Nancy. Your work is so impressive. Um, and uh, we're so lucky to have you here at the TORI. I did have a question um, about the, um, the uh, uh, you know, the adaptation that you are working on for the younger age group, uh, where you have the um, the, the caregiver and the child dyad completing the, um, um, the survey, um, you know, I, th I think we're all well aware of how the well-being of the caregiver, um, you know, is, is often just as important as the well-being of the individual child. And so how are you, um, how are you screening for that? And do you have specific questions for the caregiver or, um, you know, maybe if you can elaborate a little bit on, on some of that work in terms of uh, assessing caregiver well-being? Great question. Thank you for that. Um, one of the pieces I didn't present is that we're also working on an older youth version, um, which is intended to stretch up to approximately 30. Right now, we say we go to 18. We've got lots of high school um, students in their uh, early 20s who've also participated. But we'd like to have a measure for the um, older youth, which will capture many parents. Um, but we are trying with the younger child, children's version, the little kids version, to have the parent or the caregiver as a helper to ask the child some specific questions or give them some examples. So when they say, um, if we ask how often they are happy and they don't know what answer to pick, mom could say, oh, do you remember when we went to the park yesterday? Were you happy? And give some other examples so that the child understands what we're trying to get at because four-year-olds will really struggle to do this independently. But yes, we do need to think about how to measure the parents' well-being, and that will be with the older youth version. Dr. Cheng. Hi, Nancy. It's, uh, it's so awesome to see you with us at CHEO and, and doing this awesome work. My wife is actually from Sudbury, and so she used to talk about Wimacom all the time. Um, and, and I wanted to, to say your, your, your presentation has given me so many ideas, I think, of how this, this will help our, our own work with um, FNM, you know, First Nations, Indigenous and Métis kids and families. And also the, just the non-First um, Nations families that we work with as well, like all this focus on wellness and, and healing, it, it, all of our kids need this right now. Um, I do have a specific question. Uh, Actually, it's more of an offline thing, I think, later. But I'm starting to do some work with um, Métis Nations Ontario. And so it's really exciting to hear about how you're working with them 
uh, and I'd love to, you know, co-create resources with you and your team and, and uh, NMO. So that's it. Awesome. Well, thank you for reaching out. Um, you were one of the first people who reached out when I arrived at CHEO and I really appreciate that. So yes, let's get in contact. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Young? So Nancy, as maybe, you know, Nancy, maybe I can ask a, a question related to, um, you, you know, you, you asked us about uh, in our clinical practice and our research, and I just wonder if you could maybe touch on uh, FNM populations with uh, chronic disease. Uh, many of the uh, clinicians and researchers uh, on uh, Grand Rounds today are uh, subspecialists and focus in areas of chronic disease and have these uh, have members of the FNM population in their practice or want to include them in their research study. I wonder if you could allude to how we could uh, better incorporate them. Well, I think the starting point is to get them to a safe space where they feel that they can identify and it's having something for them. Um, why would they identify? So if you're um, running a diabetes clinic, you're going to have a large number of First Nations children in your population, um, unfortunately. But if there is some benefit to them, if you are giving them the opportunity to assess their health in a way that is a better fit for their worldview, then that's a reason for them to identify. If there are activity pages that they can do in your waiting room that look like them, then that's a reason for them to identify. And they might not even identify, they might just pick it up and start using it. And you may have um, some kids from Pakistan who pick up our emotions chart and say, that looks like me, because they're brown faces. That's okay. Our intent is to put the resources there so they can find something that feels like them. And that was the whole point of having children write the questions for the ACHWM. They literally told us, don't ask us about sex and talk about it. And yet they came up with 62 questions that were things that they do want to talk about. So if you can give them a window into something that they gravitate towards, then you can start to provide culturally relevant supports. You can start to understand their context. Understanding that a child with diabetes is living in a house with eight other people changes the clinical management of that child. But if they haven't started to share their identity and who they live with and all of that, you're in the dark. So I'd like to encourage people to just put a nightlight on somewhere and then maybe it will actually turn into a lamp and maybe then there will be some transparency and some trust and trust is the key. Thanks, Nancy. Hello. Any other questions or comments? Hello, can I yes. ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, my question is pertaining to the age. I think you have been screening or identifying the problem in the, in the kids between eight and 18 years of age. And yeah. have you noticed any difference in the emotional needs of younger children as opposed to the older? Why am I saying, because identification is very important, is screening is important and referral will be important as well there. I wonder if you can elaborate on all the spiritual needs, emotional, obviously physical, mental health. So have you found any difference in the younger and the older age people with regards to our approach towards them? So in terms of what they need and for support, that's been an interesting transition point for us. So we have been the research side of things where we can identify that there is a potential concern in the child and we pass them to the local clinicians. And it's really important that we pass them to the local clinicians because we need to connect them with somebody in the community who's gonna be there next week and next month and next year. We don't necessarily wanna keep them connected to us. So I don't know a whole lot about the services that get provided to the children after they finish with the measure because that's where our research control ends and we literally hand off to the community and respect their expertise and their right to privacy. 
So at some point, we may do a study where we get more detail on the services provided to the children. Right now, the most we have is how many appointments the children had and over what period of time. So it's a really interesting question, but I don't have the data to answer it. Any other questions or comments? Michael. Hey, Nancy. Um, I have a question for you. Do you have the tool in a way that we can just recommend it to, let's say, family physicians or primary care or even, or even schools? So Mia and Lily are both working with schools um, who are using it. Um, and we have a process where they can sign up. It's a progressive web app. If they sign up and they sign an agreement with us, then they can access the progressive web app and set up their project. And the reason they sign an agreement is that agreement says, we'll help you measure the children's health. You have to commit to being responsible for the follow-up of that child's health. And you have to be there the same day. Children don't get to go home thinking that they don't feel safe at home and nobody did anything. They, what happens is if they tell the tablet, I sometimes don't feel safe at home, a local staff member will sit down and say, let's talk about that. Tell me the story. And if the story suggests that there's risk in the home, they say, okay, I heard you. I'm going to take care of this. Let's put together a plan and we'll help you stay safe. But the worst thing you can do for a child is not listen. So this is a listening device. And yes, it could be used by family practitioners. We've got some interesting conversations to have about who owns the data and what happens to the data. Um, but we have clinicians who are just using it as the thin edge of the wedge to start a conversation with a child who doesn't want to talk. So there are lots of interesting options. And because it's a progressive web app, it works on iPads, it works on Android tablets, it works on desktop computers, it can work on phones. It's not my favorite medium, but it can. Um, so yeah, there are options. And that part is very much now into knowledge translation while we work on new innovations around it, but the core document is being shared. Thanks, Nancy, very exciting. Well, with that, we're at 930. So I really want to thank Nancy for an inspiring and thought provoking uh, grand rounds. What a great way to uh, launch the academic year for the department. Uh, please reach out to Nancy with questions and uh, potential uh, collaborations. And uh, uh, thanks everyone for joining us this morning.